In the Middle Ages, the Black Death reduced the human population of the world by more than a third. Some communities lost over 60% of their people in a few months. What are the dangers of plague in our modern world? Can we protect ourselves against the dire possibilities? Preparing for a modern plague, the doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. ceremony for a new factory. Did you mention seeing anyone who was sick? Anyone on a plane at the airport? No. She said she was jet lagged. The average person touches their face three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Ben. No, no, I, I go up to your room, honey. So we have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. Yeah, she before. had a history of seizures no, 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 and allergies. No, no. As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. Right. I said, can I go talk to her? Mr. Amos, your wife is dead. What are you talking about? Okay. What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone could weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking at? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission, so we just need to know which direction. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president underground. People will panic. Get away! It will tip over. The truth is being kept from the world. Cook your samples, destroy everything. Hello. I need you to get me the names of everyone who serviced this room. It's an emergency. You can't panic now. I know. I'm gonna get you home. I got people too, Dr. Cheever. We all do. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. We're back in your car. We're not sick! It's figuring us out faster than we're figuring it out. It's mutating. Whoa. <laughs> Hello and welcome to On Call Television. That trailer was from a movie that is called Contagion. We're talking about epidemics tonight. An epidemic is, by definition, the rapid spread of disease into a population affecting many persons at the same time. For tonight's topic, we're speaking about infectious disease that can wipe out entire populations. The top 10 deadliest epidemics in history listed by a group of public edu uh, health educators are as follows. Number 10. Native American smallpox, 1500 to 1900, which killed more than one-third of the American Indians and allowed Europeans to conquer the U.S. Number nine, 
the third cholera pandemic of 1846 to 1863, finding an infected well and setting the stage for modern epidemiology. Number eight, the Asian flu pandemic of 1856 through 1858, killing nearly two million. Number seven, the Antonin plague of 165 to 180, the major contributor to the decline of the Roman Empire. Number six, the Thirty Years' War typhus plague epidemic of 1618 to 1648, affecting mostly soldiers with lice spreading typhus and death. Number five, the Third Plague pandemic of 1855 to 1959, killing 12 million in China and India, and was finally controlled by understanding the disease. Number four, the Plague of Justinian, of 541 to 542, squelching the Byzantine emperor's power. Number three, HIV AIDS, 1981 to the present time, first recognized in the Americas in 1981. More than 15% of the population of Sub-Sahara Afri Africa are infected, and more than 25 to 30 million people have died so far. Number two, the Spanish flu of 1918 and 1919, more devastating than World War II, the flu killed 15 to 50 to 100 million people, starting simultaneously in Boston, Brest, France, Freetown, Sierra Leone. And the number one most lethal epidemic of all history, the Black Death, 1337, to 1351 with 75 to 200 million killed, a third to a half of the population of Europe. But ironically, with the labor shortage that occurred, the standard of living was consequently raised for the common person. One little good part of that one. Well, here to discuss these epidemics and more are our two guests. Dr. Jeremy Stone, uh, Storm, an infectious disease speci specialist, uh, did his medical school in Des Moines University, Des Moines, Iowa, Rapid City Regional Hospital internship in Rapid City, South Dakota, residency at the USD School of Medicine, Sioux Falls, and a fellowship at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, Iowa City, Iowa, board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease. He has special interests in immunocompromised patients, central nervous system infections, bone and joint infections, infection control and epidemiology, and drug resistance. Our other guest is Dr. Lon Keitlinger, a PhD and a master's in science and public health, he is the state epidemiologist for South Dakota Department of Public Health in Peer. He earned his PhD in epidemiology from the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina and also an MS PH in tropical medicine from Tulane University. Dr. Keitlinger has worked in public health for more than 35 years both here and in Madagascar internationally. We've got quite the, quite, quite the, the uh, guest for tonight. Uh, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about your, your story. Why did you go into infectious disease? Um, well, I enjoyed helping take care of people who had bad infections. Um, before I really knew infectious disease was a specialty, I think I gravitated towards you know, those cases. And so um, that continued throughout uh, medical school and residency and uh, you know, figured out in residency that that's what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, have, have very much enjoyed what I do, and, and every day is a, a pleasure to help people, right. help people. And what did you think of that movie, Contagion? Uh, that's a very interesting movie. Uh, it shows you, you know, maybe what could happen in the event of a bad outbreak. It, it isn't that crazy. It wasn't all Hollywood. No, I, I, you know, it's, it's a little Hollywood, but it's, it's, there's some reality to that, too. Yeah. You know, it's Great. Lon. So you've been on the show, what, 40, 50, 60 times, something like that? <laughs> a couple times, Rick, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and tell us about the tie. What, what in the heck is that tie? This is my SARS tie. Oh. And believe it or not, I've had it 10 years because 10 years ago, 2003, SARS hit. So to commemorate that, uh, Bonnie Jamison, one of my coworkers in the health department, bought me a SARS tie. Yes, well, what is SARS? 
uh, severe acute uh, respiratory syndrome. It's a coronavirus and it was completely unanticipated. Uh, evidently it was, it's a disease or a condition of a civet cat in China and people were eating it and somehow it spread to the human population. There was a, a person in um, Hong Kong that had it, was riding an elevator, coughed on a few other people, you know, just like the movie. Yeah. And it spread from here to there, it got over into Toronto, Canada. Uh, we had uh, a lot of activity here in South Dakota with it. We, it really shook me because we have people that are in the morning in Hong Kong and that night they're sleeping in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And, and, that ha and, and they were exposed and they were sick. And, and uh, did it kill anybody? Not in South Dakota, but uh, in, in Toronto it definitely did, and worldwide it killed a lot of people. A lot of people. So there is epidemics uh, in the past that we can learn from, and we'll have to talk about the dangers of the epidemics to come. Well, and not the distant path, past, not in the 1300s, but just within 10 years we've right. had epidemics. So, um, so you're, uh, you have tropical disease interest, and you, you're a public health uh, person, tell us a little bit about the whole philosophy of public health versus medical physicians. Well, it's pretty much the same, except for the for, for the physicians, the patient is there. That's one on one kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, for us, it's the whole community is our patient. It's the population of South Dakota. We monitor the disease of the state of the nation. Uh, we look for things. We're constantly doing surveillance, and we try and prevent things on a population-based level. And what got you into uh, public health? Well, infectious diseases, utter fascination. The first time, I'm, I guess my training is in parasitology, and the first time I saw a live parasite under the microscope, I was hooked. I had to know more, <laughs> had to know why, had to, and then going to Madagascar, just having people with you know, many parasites being very sick with them, malaria, worms, cystozomiasis, you know, just wanting to figure it out. And, and you know, later on we should get back to the pre-vaccination, the post-vaccination changes that happened to you in Madagascar. I've heard you tell that story before and that fascinates me. Um, but tonight, uh, this is a night without, uh, without uh, live uh, phone calls. Uh, we had the fundraiser and we had basketball and so tonight we are not live. We don't have your calls. We can't take your calls. But we have asked a number of people off the street uh, to to uh, ask us questions, and so I think you know c we should take uh, that first question that we have uh, from the street. What are some of the recent past health epidemics in the United States and in South Dakota? Uh, you, you you mentioned that well, SARS was one. What well, other things recently? Well, most recently was H one N one influenza pandemic, and that was two thousand nine. Um, we had a smaller one, a mumps epidemic in the Midwest and South Dakota. Uh, we had many cases, over 200 cases of mumps. If you were in Iowa, then I know Iowa was the epicenter of that. And uh, in college campuses, we had the West Nile epidemic um, in 2003. West Nile is now enzootic or entrenched here in South Dakota. But enzootic meaning it's, 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 it's in it's animals. Here. It's in animals. It's in the birds. But in 2003, we had over a thousand cases here in South Dakota. It spilled over from the birds into the human population in a big way. It made yep. many people sick. Jeremy, any any other epidemics of recent note that uh, that you've had experience with? Um, those are largely, I think, you know, H1N1, um, and we're still seeing, you know, f the flu this year was 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 pretty significant. Um, and then there's, you know, sometimes non-infectious epidemics, which, you know, in some ways might be getting worse. You know, some of the healthcare epidemics, obesity, uh, and some of those things, but. Um, you know, we tend to still see here in South Dakota the same things that, you know, everybody else is seeing around the world. Um, so when you see it on the national news, there's a good chance we're seeing it here, too. Well, it, it, we don't have isolated pockets of people anymore in this world, hardly. We don't. We don't. We don't. Maybe New Guinea. We're all mobile. We're, we're all, we're all yeah, mobile. <laughs> it's, it, you're in China in the morning and you're in South Dakota uh, later that evening. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I was always fascinated by the yellow fever. Uh, epidemic that occurred in the 1700s. Washington was the president. He escaped from uh, Philadelphia, to, which was the capital at the time. Yellow fever is one of those mean viruses that, that um, they're seeing other viruses that are like the yellow fever. Uh, and I'm trying to think 
Well, West Nile, that's not. Well, West Nile that's is not, That's not all that unsimilar. You know, no. they're, they're arboviral mosquito-borne. Co coronavirus, is that what it is? I mean, there is the... Flavivirus. Flavivirus, that's Isn't it. it? That's yeah. it. Yep, Flavivirus. that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's uh, something about the yellow fever vaccine that's been happening lately. I, I don't know. They're, they're, I know. What do we know? Uh, we have to be, you know, I believe it's a live virus vaccine. And so you, you need to be a little bit careful about who you give it to. And there's potential for, you know, side effects, reactions, and, and, and people can develop the illness. And so we need to be a little careful, you know, and usually it's travelers uh, who would be getting vaccination for that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's recommended strongly uh, when people are traveling to an endemic area. And, and some countries require the vaccination to, to actually go to their country. Or otherwise, uh, if you get a layover in another country from an area that's high risk for yellow fever, uh, they basically are going to expect that you've had it or they're not going to let you board your plane. Right. Now, another epidemic that's happened in South Dakota of late, within the last 15 years, I think, is the hantavirus with uh, mice urine and so on. What, what's, what's the story about that? Not a big one in well, South Dakota. You know, I don't know if you'd call that an epidemic because we have a case or two every year. And it's, it's been very tragic because we've had young people that have died. Last year we had a, a young girl, seven years of age, die of it. Um, a few years ago we had boom, 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 three young boys in their 20s die one year after another in southeast South Dakota in uh, Bonholm, Turner, and um, McCook County. So it's here, but well, it's, it's probably like one case a year or so yeah, that we yeah, get here. But it's a weird one because, you know, mice are everywhere. Everybody, there's a lot of mice, right? Mm -hmm. So why does this happen? And what could those three guys or that seven-year-old girl done to prevent the, the mouse well, urine? Well, it's, it's, it, 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 it's in the mouse droppings and in their nesting material and their urine. And somehow that gets aerosolized. It gets pushed up into the dust and you breathe it in. Um, not all mice carry it. It's especially with the uh, white-footed deer mouse is the is main the reservoir. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's here we have it in this state. People just have to be careful. When you see some mouse junk in the corner, don't get the vacuum cleaner, don't get the broom, but squirt a little bleach solution on it and wipe it up very carefully because it could contain hantavirus. Oh, that's a great uh, hint. Uh, spray it with a little bleach solution yeah, yeah. and then wipe it up. You know, I think in Yosemite uh, this past summer, oh, we had the issues, big, yeah, big, antivirus big in, the, yeah. in the tents or the, you know, and that was a big problem. And, you know, that's the benefit of obviously having good public health service, you know, because uh, that's how those things get noticed because it's going to be a provider here, a provider there. And in Yosemite, those people are coming from all over the world. Yeah, dispersed and, all over. Yeah, and and so. Connect the dots. Mm -hmm. So before we take the next question, so what, how do you make a bleach spray? Uh, not 100% bleach, you know, you're going to... No, know, no, it's... Uh, one, one to 20 or something? Yeah, something like that. I can't remember exactly. It's like... Put, put a, a it's, dopper full It's and mostly water. water, like it's one to 10 or one to five or something, depending on how strong you Lysol want it. would help? Yeah, well, bleach is just the best. That's the cheapest and okay. the best, so that's what we tell people. All right, okay. Well, we have another question now. Whatever happened to the bird flu? Ah, the bird flu. So what happened to the bird it's flu? It's still out there, Rick. It's, it's still here. <laughs> H5N1, it's still out there. It's still in Asia. Cambodia is having uh, kids die of it. They've had several deaths this year. So it is still there. And I don't know, we're still preparing for it, but it, it has lost its hype, I think. Yeah, we've, I think, probably a little bit been lulled to sleep, but, yeah. um, you know, it still doesn't transmit very efficiently no. from human to human, and that's why it hasn't exploded. But, you know, it's a, that's a disease with probably over 50% mortality, so. so if, it'll kill 50% of the people who get it. Yep. And oh, if that, a respiratory infection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And supposedly it's uh, two mutations away from, you know, becoming easily, easily transmittable. Spread. So, you know, we really don't know what is going to happen with that, but, uh, you know, we're watching it. People around the world are really. I mean, that could be it. the next. That could be the next. If you're going to bet on the next uh, well, play, it's, it's on the it's on the board. Yeah. Are we going to have a? Why have we not developed a vaccine against it then? Or well, there's a vaccine. There's a skeletal vaccine for it, but it's not in production yet because with influenza, it's always changing, and you never know exactly what the final uh, virus is going to look like. And so. it is an influenza. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's that's what, what is an influenza then? I mean, what what is influenza? 
Everybody talks about flu, and then of course people talk about diarrhea at the same time. That's wrong. It's not a diarrhea unless it's a respiratory. But what is that? Uh, it's a type of virus, um, you know, it has an H uh, component and an N component, uh, uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminid uh, neuraminidase, uh, and the type of that kind of changes uh, between the different viruses. A and B have different kind of parts to that, uh, and, you know, depending on uh, the changes in each of those kind of parts of the structure of the virus kind of depend changes maybe how virulent they get or how easily they spread and, and every year can be different uh, how they uh, transmit and affect people. Right, the, the influenza. So, I mean, you guys both recommend a flu shot in the oh, fall. Yes, of course, yeah. It's well, the most important thing people can do to prevent the flu. It's, all, it's almost the only thing you can do. Yeah. It's, our, it's our best weapon, imperfect, but our best weapon. Yep. Yeah. And how about, it changed from doing it October 31st, you know, at Halloween, to doing it earlier and then maybe getting another one later? I mean, what's your word on that? Get one and get it as early as you can. And the reason it changed is because the supply side increased. We used to have to ration it. Wasn't that long ago we were rationing flu vaccine yeah. in, in South Dakota. So it'd be nice to not run yeah. out. Now there's 150 million doses. There's enough for everybody that wants one. And you can start earlier because we don't know when exactly it's going to hit. Okay. It usually hits fall, winter. But That's a su supply thing then. Yeah. Well, how, I mean, this year I did not see a lot of flu. I'm, and I think part of the reason is that we had a lot of people take that flu shot this year. And I'm thinking it was effic uh, efficacious. Which, yes? No? You. Well, <laughs> fairly so. Fairly so. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, Rick. You know, some vaccines, it's about 99%. Like the measles vaccine, you get that. That's, that's going to protect you. But influenza... You know, we're lucky if it's 90% efficacious. This year, in the recent studies, have shown it's about 62%. Better in young people, worse in the older people. We, we didn't hit the target? I mean, we didn't pick the right? No, we picked the right one, but the, but the virus went and changed out from under us. It's always changing. It's always <laughs> mutating. It's always evolving. So it's, 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 it's not an exact science with that yet. Yeah. But they're working on it. They're working on... You know, uh, a, a universal flu vaccine. That, it was you know. better this year, though. Then I mean, I thought that uh, that uh, it seemed we seemed better. But well, no, no. The numbers didn't. No, support. we had we had more people hospitalized this year. We had 35 deaths already this year, and that's you know more than we've had you know in in in, in many years. This was a bad flu season nationally and. In South Dakota, we had a lot of people hospitalized. I don't know, maybe Brookings is. We, we didn't do. The, yeah, well, I saw. You know, but in the, in the, who knows that it was, inf we didn't note that many with in influenza uh, that was so sick. I mean, people get pneumonia when they're 90s and mm -hmm. they get a little flu or they get a cold and it's not influenza and then they get the p bacteria follow up infection. Yeah. Not one that would be prevented by an early antibiotic, but one that needs to be started when the secondary infection yeah. starts. Um, so was there a geographic spread of that influenza and the deaths, or was it mostly in Sioux Falls, or did you find it in Rapid City, or? Oh, well, Pennington County had five deaths. Uh, Sioux Falls, uh, Minnehaha County had five deaths, too. Uh, Brown County had three deaths, and a bunch of other deaths scra scattered around. The, it was pretty evenly distributed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we'll take, we've got another question coming up right here. How will residents know if there's an epidemic coming to Brookings? So, how do we know an epidemic is coming? Well, we generally should, you know, we're going to call on you guys in the infectious <clears throat> disease world and the public health department to warn us. Well, hopefully your friendly health department is going to be tracking it for you and doing surveillance and listening to what's happening in other states. Uh, but sometimes it happens at the hospital and it's the doc that is, is the first one. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes you just start seeing more of something. Um, like this summer with West Nile, we started seeing one, two, three, four, and, and that was early on. And, and we kind of got the sense of infectious disease that this is going to be a bad year. And indeed it was. Um, and that's like anything, you know, you kind of start to see, especially the viral things, you see one, you see two, you can kind of see what's coming. And I think with, uh, you know, social media and television, um, you know, it's, it's pretty easy, I think, sometimes to get the word out and kind of know. Uh, and, you know, p I think communication, you know, people in the community talk, families talk, people talk, uh, relatives in different towns, and, and people kind of, I think, have a good barometer of what's going on. 
sometimes even better than, than we do. So, I mean, it, you were saying. Well, yeah, when Jeremy sees, has, has a patient with something, he has three days to report it to the health department. Right. And, you know, he's maybe seeing one. Other hospitals seeing another. Brookings is seeing something. Rapid City is seeing something. And they're supposed to report that within three days. Certain diseases immediately, like plague, immediately. And it's our job in the health department to connect the dots and see. So hopefully we have a bigger picture and then we can report back to all you guys that you know, this is on the increase and wow, we're getting hit by this and let's respond. Yeah. Um, it brings to mind uh, bioterrorism, you know, because we lean upon the public health department and we lean upon our infectious disease people if, if it is a, an infectious uh, process. You are probably not uh, when we had the big anthrax. Still probably in the training, but you know, not practicing probably at that point. But what, what take home message would you take from that whole story of the anthrax uh, that was being bio terror? Uh, weaponized. Weaponized. Yeah, weaponized. Yeah. You know, it's, it's scary, you know, these are out there, they can still be got, they can, these things can still happen because they do, they have, um, you know, Obviously, to an extent, you can't prevent them, but when they're noticed and discovered, you know, the correct steps can be taken. Um, and so, you know, it's just staying in touch, I think, with your physicians, your, you know, health department. And, you know, we, we have an excellent health department who always has updates. Their website's excellent. You can track a lot of these things and what's going on in our state. But uh, you don't really ever know always what's on the horizon, uh, sometimes until it's happened. People have a a panic level that sometimes uh, would be the worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, panic. Panic, yep. the, the worst part of it. Lon, you were going to say something. Well, yeah, I, I, I guess there's the anthrax, which was weaponized. Plague, we worry about that being weaponized in, into an aerosol situation. Tularemia, same thing, category A bioterrorism agents. And we have all three of those naturally in South Dakota. Hardly a year goes by that we don't have anthrax and cattle in the state. We always have tularemia in humans and in our prairie dogs and little ground critters right. every year. So It's and, here, I mean. Yeah, we, we, it's here and people come in contact with them, but the bad guy is making a, a bomb or a weapon out of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and uh, those are lethal, those are lethal oh, very, infections. Very, very much yeah. so. And uh, I've, you know, we've, I've heard about a few cases, people mowing the rabbit, the dead rabbit, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> don't mow the dead rabbit, you know, pick it up and throw it away. Oh, I had That's a case. I, a man came in with uh, a pneumonia, an older guy, but I mean, you know, he was still moving the day before. This day he's just wiped out, you know, and he comes in, it's classic pneumonia, and I start him on, uh, I think at the time it was a, a Keflex or Ansef, just a one single antibiotic and I put him up, this is in the 80s, put him up on the floor and the nurse says, he's losing ground, we're, we're losing this man, his respiratory status is getting worse. So I could see we were in big time trouble, I added genomycin and then I put him on a respirator, I dropped a, uh, intubated him, so he was on a breathing machine and uh, his fever shot sky high and he was very sick uh, for a couple of days as we were taking care of him and then the culture came back and they said we think there could be some tularemia in this and so then there was okay that's a dangerous organism to deal with and it had to be shipped from our lab to somewhere else indeed it was tularemia and indeed uh, I'm glad I started genomycin because it had good coverage and indeed the guy came out of it and about a month after he was hospitalized in Brookings we took the breathing tube out and we were able to pull it out and he was able to talk to us and I said, you nodded no, you said no to any exposure to rabbits. Uh, you know, he, I, I want to talk to you about that. He said, yeah, I'm not, I haven't touched rabbits, I don't go near them. Uh, what have you, but there have been some dead rabbits in my, uh, I, I've seen them in, where? Well, in the yard. Well, what were you doing in the yard? Well, mowing. Well, did you mow over those rabbits? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Poof. <laughs> yeah. Tularemia. Dangerous. Um, well, I think we, we're, we're going to move on to our next question. Are South Dakota hospitals prepared to handle an epidemic if it occurs? Well, Jeremy, mm -hmm. what do you think of that question? That's a tough one. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, 
You know, the answer is probably, you know, in the middle of yes and no. Um, you know, largely the services to care for the sick people are there. Um, you know, one of the big things people can do is if they're sick, you know, to stay home. Uh, you know, sometimes even, you know, from work, from school, and from the hospital. So, uh, you know, unless somebody's sick enough to be in the hospital, uh, they shouldn't go to the hospital or even sometimes go out. And so, um, you know, once, you know, it's figured out sometimes what the problem is, the epidemic is, it can be dealt with much better. Um, you know, but there's this certain degree of probably fear in the community that's impossible to, uh, you know, displace or, you know, it's just, it's going to be some, you know, time before, you know, until it's figured out, you know, what, what, what's exactly going on. But, you know, the hospitals, uh, you know, there's a lot of hospital beds and, you know, every few years something comes up and we kind of go through the training. And so uh, even though we, we probably haven't had, you know, the big outbreaks that, you know, sometimes we might worry about or like in contagion, um, you know, we've kind of gone through a lot of training kind of procedures to help deal with these. And uh, it, it's not going to be perfect if it ever happens, but, uh, you know, we try the best we can. Try to be prepared. It's yeah. a lot better than it was 10 years ago at, at the time of the anthrax attacks and at the time of the SARS and things like that. We've done a lot of preparations. Hospitals now have at least plans and surge capacity, and we have communities that have points of dispensing so we can give vaccine or give antibiotics to people outside the hospital. Hot, like here in Brookings, um, your Swift Health Center would be transformed into a, a, a surge hospital. The cots are ready, the curtains are ready. So yeah, we're ready. I mean, yeah. it's an amazing thing. We are a lot better yeah. than we were. But if you end up with 50% of the people getting a death-defying pneumonia, that death-defying, uh, death-causing pneumonia, uh, and the treatment is going to be support like a respirator, you, there's no way you're going to have enough people. Well, you know, we have ventilators stockpiled now. In we Pierre, in the, in the stockpile, we've got doxycycline, we've got Z-Packs, we've got over a million um, masks, respirator, you know, the N95 For, masks. To protect from in right. spreading of infection so that I could wear the mask and not get it from you yeah, if you had it. Over 110,000 doses of Tamiflu, so we've got a, a stockpile that can be released if necessary. So, you know, so it, we're, it, it'll be rough, it'll be tough, but we're better off today than we were a decade ago. Okay, uh, and we're gonna have to talk about quarantining and the value of that and uh, how we eliminated smallpox from this earth, but uh, let's, I think we should get to the next question. Uh, is there any smallpox in the world? <laughs> That was a perfect question. So let's talk about smallpox and how we got rid of it. Jeremy. Uh, largely through uh, vaccination campaigns. Um, and you know now uh, it largely exists in, uh, in research labs. Um, and uh, so there hasn't been any you know, cases and knock on wood, hopefully no, no future cases. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, in, a, in a deep, deep freezer in, at the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, and one's in Russia. And to me, I, I, I take smallpox seriously. That's when I started my career in public health in uh, 1978, and that was the year it was declared eradicated. They tracked down the last case in the Horn of Africa, found him, put him in quarantine and isolation for a while, and that was it. And then a year later, the World Health Organization declared uh, smallpox eradicated. When we invaded Iraq, we were afraid that they had um, weapon, weaponized yeah. smallpox and were going to blast that out uh, at us. So we had a massive effort in the United States to get key people vaccinated, physicians, public health people, and it never came. They never had it. They so didn't, they didn't have it. Now, the, the idea of, so you had an isolated group, a, a, a village of smallpox, a pocket of smallpox in a village in Africa, so what they did was they would surround it with vaccination. Now, tell, right. explain right. that. What is that? That's, there's a name for that? or they Well, ring vaccination. It's, yeah. ex ex it's exactly what we're doing with polio now because we're on the last, hopefully, gasp of polio. It's in Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. You know, very few cases left. And once that's gone, it'll be eradicated. So, and we, we, we vaccinate all of, the, all of the people around it and try to quarantine the people who are sick and then and then vaccinate them later. Yeah, but we're running into problems. There's, there's political problems. Um, fundamentalist Muslims are... Not excited about getting well, vaccinated. Well, I don't know. They think it's a Western plot or something, and you know, I don't know. It's all... But their, their governments are you know, committed to doing it. And India 
eradicated polio within India within the past year or so. I think it was last June that was declared. And if they can do it in India, they can do it in those other countries. Right. There's a certain amount of will there, but there's still some resistant groups. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody is comfortable with vaccination. What would you say, to Jeremy, about the safety of vaccinations and why people are afraid of them? I think, uh, you know, largely vaccinations are safe. Um, you know, in the 90s, there was this possible tie to autism, which has come now uh, more so uh, to light that this was kind of faulty research. Um, and so... Or a lie. Or, you know, I'll... A yeah, hoax. and so a hoax. And so, I mean, the, the journals that published that um, retracted the study. And, you know, the, a lot of the authors on that case, you know, uh, were somewhat misled and, you know, how the research was handled. And it was pri the primary author who was the problem. But, um, you know, that's kind of given vaccination somewhat of a bad rap, so to speak. But, you know, all, all you'd have to do is probably talk to somebody with polio because people are alive who had polio or talk to somebody who's husband or wife died of the flu uh, who didn't get vaccinated. I mean, you can see the importance of these. Uh, and, you know, largely the side effects, you know, in, in a lot of studies, uh, especially, you know, if it's for a lot of the vir you know, vaccines, they're, they're not live viruses, they're relatively safe. Um, you know, it's the risks are the same as placebo, you know, injection site reactions, uh, you know, arm might be sore for a day or two, but they're very well tolerated. Uh, they're excellent at preventing these things, and it's the best thing people can do to prevent getting sick. Right. Uh, and there's some new stuff about eggs, I heard. I mean, they, they've taken eggs out of all of them or the, the element that, that might cause allergies. Have you heard any oh, of that? Oh, in uh, influenza? No, no, they still make them in eggs the good old-fashioned way, but they're working on a, a better a, way. Yeah, a, a better way. So that's okay. yet to come. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have another question. Is there a vaccine on the horizon to prevent HIV? So there you go, HIV. That's an, a real epidemic that is still happening, right? Uh, where are we with the vaccination? Jeremy? Um, I read a lot of, you know, there's research out there. Um, they're trying to develop a vaccine. Uh, it hasn't uh, made it to fruition yet, but there's the, the drug companies and there's groups out there uh, that are working on it. Um, it might be some time off, but you know, there's a lot of funding and there's a lot of money in HIV research and obvious by the medicines. Um, the medicines are a lot better. The medicines are you know, very good now. People can, get, can live a long time with HIV due to the medicines and uh, they're gonna end up, if they take their medicines, you know, they're gonna have more uh, problems from their, the general medical illnesses like heart disease, diabetes, and all those things than they probably will even from the HIV. So, um, but I think it, it's, it's probably in the future um, but, uh, you know, we're a ways off from that, but it's getting closer probably. Well, and we were, I was boistered just a couple of weeks ago with that announcement that that baby had been cured. Cured, if that's, that's yeah. the second person cured. Yeah, so, you know, there's, I, I think we're inching along there, but back in the, in the early 80s when this hit, it was, it was catastrophic, so we've come a long ways. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, question, let's do another question. What is plague? Uh, so what is the infection, the plague? Jeremy. Uh, plague, I mean, specifically, it, it's uh, the disease caused by Yersinia uh, pestis, or Yersinia classically um, causes a, a different sometimes process, but, you know, uh, there'll be a, a bubo or, or sore. Um, people can get quite ill. Um, it's had somewhat different forms, I think, historically, uh, different periods. It's presented a little bit differently, which uh, I guess in more modern times uh, in the U.S. Has, has made it somewhat times confusing uh, to know if it really was the plague. But uh, it's a very interesting bacteria, um, and it's still around uh, in the environment, in the, in the animals. So. Yeah, it's an animal disease, and it was an old world disease and it was introduced into California back in the 1800s and it's been slowly working its way eastward. Uh, there was some early evidence, oh, maybe 20 years or so ago in a, some coyote blood in southwest South Dakota, but it was 2004 that w it was actually found in prairie dogs in uh, Shannon County, Fall River County, Custer County down there and they had just the entire prairie dog town was wiped out. And since by then, the plague or by us? No, 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 by the plague, by the plague. Killed the prairie dog. Killed them. 
And in subsequent years, uh, it's gone into other counties in western South Dakota. Last year it was detected in Lyman County and Stanley County, just right across the river from Pierre. In the rodents there or the prairie dogs? Well, in fleas, uh, PCR method in fleas, but then also in prairie dogs too. So it's here in South Dakota. We haven't had a human case yet, but every year there's a couple human cases in the United States. Remember that one a couple years ago with the biologist? Yeah, tell us about well, that. Yeah, there was a mountain lion, and I know South Dakota has mountain lion, lion fever now too, but um, they found this dead mountain lion, so the biologist um, was going to do an autopsy on the right. critter. So cut it open and was looking at its organs to see what had died from, and he wasn't protecting himself, and the mountain lion had died of plague, and the biologist got himself infected. And within a couple of days, he developed a fever, started getting sick, and just, and just died, yeah. yeah. It, 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 so it's an animal disease, it's out there, it's rare in humans, but Colorado has a case so every year or so. Yeah, and so it, it really, it's carried, it's a bacteria that's carried in the flea that rides on the back of those rodents. Mm -hmm. um, we'll take the next question. Is there a specific time frame or symptom presentation that has to occur after a wrestler has been diagnosed with mat herpes on when he is allowed to get back on the mat and compete. Okay, well that's a specific, oh that was a specific question. Let's talk about, um, the last part though we wanna get into is when can they compete again? Let's talk about illnesses of wrestlers. Mm -hmm. Jeremy. You know, that's obviously something uh, wrestlers can get. You know, there's uh, MRSA, MRSA is a, is a bacterial uh, infection or spread sometimes with close contact and, um, you know, largely, you know, if, if somebody develops uh, a sore or skin ulcer um, or they start feeling sick and they have a, a sport like wrestling or football, uh, obviously they should take it to their doctor. Um, and these things do come up. Um, I can't say I've, I've seen a case personally of a uh, Matt Herpes, but, um, you know, uh, we see sometimes MRSA in athletes. Um, so let's talk about MRSA. Yeah. This is the tissue melting killing disease that people talk about that has developed really in recent years because of, oh, antibiotic overuse. Yeah. Uh, tell us about what, what does methicillin resistance, staph aureus, tell us about it. Um, you know, largely it's a, it's a type of staph. Um, traditionally, MRSA was more a hospital bug, something you got from being in the hospitals. It was largely resistant to everything except one or two antibiotics. And then, uh, you know, the community strains of staph that, you know, we, we typically differentiated things, at least with, in terms of staph aureus, into hospital, bit, you know, acquired or related and, and you know, kind of a, a community related, so out of the hospital. But uh, the community staff changed, uh, so the staff that's in the community changed. Uh, it became, uh, you know, like MRSA in that it became more resistant to the drugs, less so than the hospital strains, but much more, I think, efficient at causing infections than the hospital strains, and people getting more skin infections, bacteremia or bloodstream infection. Uh, and so I, I think we've seen, uh, you know, really a a ter it'd be a terrible problem in the last 20 years. It, and, and it's because of all the uh, uh, overuse of antibiotics and then you get a resistant organism. Yep. Is the MRSA staph aureus uh, that we have now any more ag or less aggressive, more aggressive than the plain old staph that we had 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago? Yep. Or, or is it just resistant? It's, it's more aggressive and it's more resistant. So it's probably both, although the sensitive staph or the nice staph can still cause you know, bad illnesses or infections. And, and probably uh, you know, a lot of it has been antibiotics that have shifted somewhat the resistance profile. And, and there's some kind of theory and, and probably some good research on this showing fluoroquinolones like Cipro, uh, Levofloxacin might be somewhat responsible because they treat staph or sensitive staph. And when you treat something or something's prescribed over and over. over and over and over, you knock out the good stuff and it kind of just lets the bad stuff flourish. And, and that's probably partly what happened. Uh, I know uh, people who have cut down on their fluoroquinolone use have at the same time seen their M rates of MRSA decline. Um, which I is think that's really problem. true. That is something that I've noticed as well. And we try to use fluoroquinolones very selectively in our hospital. Um, any more about MRSA? Well, you asked about how it was 
before yeah. the resistance well. When you started practicing as a physician in the 1960s, how was staff then? Well, it was mean and pussy and awful, and but now it's the same, but it's, it's resistance. I could treat it then. Yeah, you could treat it, yeah. I, that's what I thought. You know, I'm an old guy. I've seen, I've seen it around. It's the same darn staff. But we don't have ammunition now. We've got old. We've got the slow drugs to to, to work. Mm -hmm. We want to before we go any further, though. We want to talk about herpes simplex and and gladiatorum uh, herpes. He's he's asking that specific question. Well, uh, for the wrestlers herpes, the, the rule of thumb is when they're not infectious, they can they they can come back. And sometimes if they've got it here, if they bandage it up good and then they can do it by and large for something like that, it's between their doc, their coach, the parents and the kid to know when they could come back. Always be cautious, always be safe. I, I, I generally uh, say that I get them on the anti herpes drug and when it it's like chicken, it's a relative of chicken pox when it is no longer a blister and now it's dried up scab, I think we can cover it. Is that what you would yeah, do? Yeah, usually when it's those, you know, basically they start to crust over is when they're not contagious anymore. And so, you know, largely for most of these, even, you know, MRSA or herpes, uh, until the lesions, if it's wet, you know, you probably Ridiculous. shouldn't be wrestling, so. Yeah. Um, That's his answer, yeah. well, if it's wet, no. Yeah, and then until it's crusted. And then clean the mat. Make sure that it's not there for the next guy to roll in. Um, clean, clean the towels. Shower. Good hygiene. All that helps. Right. Um, impetigo. Isn't that staff and strep kind of a combination? Any comments about that? Uh, you know, strep uh, staff can sometimes have an impetigo-like presentation. Um, can be sometimes confusing because herpes viruses can look a lot like that. And so, um, you know, when, when people see that, obviously the big thing to do is get a culture and you can do a herpes, cult, you know, PCR culture. There's ways to test for that. There's ways to test for strep and, and staph. Um, one you treat with antivirals, one you treat with antibiotics, but that can be a significant problem too. And we see those occasionally and people get hospitalized for. Okay. Well, on 30 seconds, uh, anything else about uh, wrestling diseases? Well. If, if you're talking about MRSA, it gets into schools. And in the health department, we get lots of calls from schools, daycares, kindergartens, of one child comes with MRSA and they don't know what to do. They want to spend a lot of money cleaning the school yeah. or kick the kid out. Yeah. And it's yeah. everywhere. Yeah, it's, in fact, we all got it in our nose. Not MRSA probably, but we've got plain old staff aureus. What about a quarter of us or 15%? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're just carrying it. It's, it's normal flora. It's everywhere. Yeah, so. Now we just have a resistance. The major thing is, don't push your doctor for antibiotics. Mm -hmm. That's the major take home. And I saw one person, uh, and some different types of staff have a resistance profile similar to MRSA. Uh, and I've seen even uh, uh, people who didn't have MRSA were told they had MRSA. And this, this I know this was a grandma. She, she quit holding her grandkids, she wore gloves. Like sh she wasn't gonna touch anybody or anything. And, and sh it was totally unnecessary because it actually wasn't MRSA, it was a different type of staff. But uh, it's in the community, it's everywhere. It's so. everywhere. Well, well, we'll be back right after this. Go ahead. Open it. Thanks. It's a baby hazmat suit. It'll help protect your baby. Be careful in school, Billy. Oh, I remember my first dorm room. Finally! One more thing. There are other ways to help protect yourself and your loved ones against certain diseases. Vaccines can help and are not only important for babies and young children, but throughout your entire lifetime. The CDC recommends vaccines to help prevent more than 15 diseases and has vaccination schedules for children, preteens, teens, and adults. To learn more about vaccines for all stages of life, talk to your health care provider. There's a powerful lesson from the medieval plague and the terrible black death. An earlier and similar epidemic killed half of Europe during the sixth and seventh century, but then seemed to disappear for about 700 years until the plague raised its ugly head again in China 
beginning the greatest international public health disaster in recorded history. This scourge is thought to have killed 25 million people in China while spreading down the Silk Road through Mongolia, India, and Central Asia, eventually reaching Europe and killing up to 200 million. From the account of an Italian historian, the infection entered Europe from the established Italian trading port of Caffa, an ancient city near Yalta on the Black Sea. It was here the caravan routes of the Far East connected to the shipping trade of Europe. And it was here, during a Mongol siege of the city, the story turns ghastly. In 1346, apparently the epidemic had reached the Mongol army waiting outside that walled city. As they were struck down by the mysterious and deadly illness, they began hurling by catapult infected corpses over the walls. It was said mountains of dead bodies piled up inside, and indeed, the illness quickly spread within. Soon, tremendous havoc, death, and panic took over, and fleeing sailors in 12 galleys carried that pestilence out into the Black Sea, over into the Mediterranean, becoming death ships, carrying it into Genoa, Italy. Over the next three years, the horror spread through Europe, killing one-third to one-half of the European population. As one chronicled, so wasted the people that scarce the tenth person of any sort was left. People were horrifically lying everywhere unattended as they died. The consequences of such traumatic social stress resulted in widespread per persecution of minorities, Jews, foreigners, beggars, lepers, even people with psoriasis, any strange rash, even bad acne. And if fear and paranoia were not enough, guilt went ballistic with the brotherhood of flagellants and self-whipping growing to 800,000 people at its peak. 500 years later, scientists Alex Yersin and P.L. Simond defined how the plague bacteria, Yersinia pestis, infects fleas riding on the backs of rats. Infection within the flea causes a strange, voracious feeding behavior and then vomiting. And when such an infected flea finds a human, there is aggressive biting with a blood meal and then regurgitation uh, of bacteria are then flushed into the feeding site and thus the infection is spread. Once infected, many people are dead in two days. 80% without treatment are dead in eight. Scientific discovery brought us to understand the cause of the Black Death. Knowledge is our best protector from the future plagues. God bless science. We've got 30 seconds to, to respond. Lon? Well, the three states declared pertussis epidemics last year, Colorado, Washington, and um, Vermont. Minnesota, Minnesota had over 4,000 pertussis cases, the most since 1938. South Dakota, we only had about 70 last year. I don't know why we were spared, but we've got to be prepared. People need to get their kids vaccinated at, when they're young and, and at middle school age. Jeremy? And, you know, I think uh, hasn't been probably so much a problem here, but we're seeing internationally a lot of measles and mumps um, outbreaks. And, you know, again, MMR, uh, it's on the vaccination list. Um, and so, you know, the best thing you can do to protect yourself is get vaccinated. Thanks so much. Well, this brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our studio guests, Dr. Jeremy Storm with infectious disease specialists in Sioux Falls and Lon Keitlinger, the state epidemiologist with the South Dakota Department of Health and Peer for helping answer those wonderful questions from our audience. American novelist Mark Twain, known for his satire, broke serious when visiting the tomb of St. Charles Borromeo, Bishop of Milan during the plague of 1576. Brave when all others were cowards, full of compassion when pity had been crushed out of all other breasts 
by the instinct of self-preservation gone mad with terror, cheering all, praying with all, helping with all with hand and brain and purse at a time when parents forsook their children, the friend deserted the friend, and the brother turned away from the sister with her pleadings were still wailing in his ears. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.